Very nice. I never had, I've never had a bell. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. Yes, please. Standard. Uh, what, 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 what's that? You're right. I can I can show you. Um, I mean is any for any anti-symmetric matrix uh, there exists a, an orthogonal one that well no yeah that came I, I, I chose even dimension here because it's our case and it's easier with anti-symmetric it'd be true anyway but it's just easier to state um, where you can bring the anti-symmetric matrix to this form. Um, and the way you do it, you prove it, is by, it's very simple, it's just that A squared is symmetric, and then you diagonalize A squared and get those. Yeah? Yeah. So that's why I meant, so this is, this O does that job, and then, and then the, through this very, very simple you know, matrix manipulation, algebraic property, you can, you can prove normal mode decomposition in general, yeah? Um, yes. So, what do we want, we wanted the, the then again, the, um, the spectrum of this state, so that we can understand how the spectrum of any Gaussian state works. And we managed to boil it down to the spectrum of this exponential, which in turn means that this represents a bunch of Hamiltonians which are given by as omega j xj squared plus pj squared. Yeah? 
So this is the standard harmonic oscillator, and you all know how to. Do I have a, do I have a half? Maybe not. Maybe yes. Who knows? But uh, yeah, there's a half as even in the standard definition. Yeah. So this and so so up to well, h bar is always equal one. Oh yeah, I didn't even talk about h bar, but there'll be an h bar that like in the very first time. And um, so, um, the, so, so you all know what, how to diagonalize this. It's, a, it's the Fock basis, essentially. And it's just, a, you know, standard harmonic oscillators. They're all equally spaced. They come in as many modes as you like. But in the end, uh, in the end, do I have an expression for this? In the end? Um, well, yeah, I mean, there's nothing else to say. We just have to exponentiate, exponentiate this, okay? So, essentially, yes. No, okay, so the way it goes is any, so this is a definition of Gaussian state. Yeah? So, so, so yeah, I'm saying. So I'm saying, I'm saying, uh, well, I'm not saying anything because this is a definition. But then if you want, you can also prove, you would prove, you can prove later that, that we can prove later, but this is just something that's very, Maybe not, not today, but you can prove that these are all the states with Gaussian Wigner function. To go back to your question, yes. And I'm saying, though, something else. I'm saying that, you know, because diagonalizing this, this is just a function of h up to normalization. So diagonalizing this is the same as diagonalizing this. And diagonalizing this means that um, you'll have a displacement so first, a, a symplectic, so a second-order operation, then a displacement acting on top of it, well, and then uh, a central Hamiltonian, which is given by a tensor product of, uh, no, actually a sum, sorry, <laughs> a sum of, uh, of these Hamiltonians, okay? That's what we're saying. That's, that's uh, the path. And therefore, uh, any Gaussian state is orthogonal in the Fock basis of those normal modes, yeah. So that's the that's the the, the, the so we, we found the eigenbasis, and and the spectrum will be just given by exponentiating. So the spectrum is given by to be more specific, uh, a product a tensor product obviously of e to the minus beta. Omega J because of the way we we decided to uh, write down these variables. Uh, times N J. Yeah? And then you need to take so these are the eigenvalues and the but the eigenvalues are products of this over all possible NJs. Okay? Yeah? And, uh, yeah. So, so, but, but this specific exponentially decay spectra are then a property of Gaussian states. Okay? And this is something that I do in the notes as well. Let me get rid of this beta. I wanted beta for other reasons, but I can just put a psi j. Absorb all the betas in the eigenfrequencies of the Hamiltonian. Yeah, because it, it is irrelevant, so. And then, uh, so that's the spectrum. We could then, in principle, determine entropies. But one thing I want to do is, there's a, there's, there's a more, so obviously this will boil down to Gaussian distributions in the end, right? So they can be mapped into. And uh, like any Gaussian function, all of these parameters, which are, you know, the eigenfrequencies, 
the first moment and the uh, and the the s which is in the, which is in the end then just expressed as a, a 2n times 2n symmetric matrix yeah they can be encoded in other more uh, operational parameters and which i'm going to do now uh, blah blah we know what symplectics are so okay So, ah, uh, nah, we don't need this anymore. So, So instead of describing the Gaussian state with all of those parameters that, that encode H and therefore the state through exponentiation, you can um, use more uh, direct operational definitions. And that would be, uh, so first moments are just simply the you know, expectation values of this, this R. And surprise, surprise, it takes two lines to see that uh, essentially the expectation, if you don't have any displacement, the expectation value will be zero because you have odd uh, combination of canonical operators acting on even, and, and it's very simple to see that they're always zero. Uh, but the displacement just displaces it. That's obvious. And then there's a the covariance matrix, which is in its symmetrized form. It will be given by Transposed. So, by which we mean, again, the anti commutator is taken in the outer product sense, like here. So, we want to do all possible pairs of X and P's and anti commute them and get the expectation value. Yeah? So, this thing, now, uh, Yeah, I'll just give you a very brief idea of how to go about it. And it will be that, so the state, rho, which I wrote before, um, rho is the R. Uh, um, and then S. And then uh, e to the minus s and the r. Did I say anything right? Yeah, with a half, I forget. Over the trace of rho, I don't care what it is. I mean, we could calculate it, but let me dispense with it. Um, or oh, the product, yeah. Uh, J. This is a, a tensor product, eh? So tensor product in Hilbert spaces become direct sums there. And this is something that we're going to see. So this is a tensor product over all j's. These are all the normal modes. 
and there's some symplectic acting on the Hilbert, some symplectic, some representation of a symplectic in the Hilbert space, and then a displacement there. Now, uh, when you take this sigma, so if you put that raw in here, what's going to happen is that you are uh, displaced. So this dr will just displace the commutator. Yeah, I can take this dr there and act everywhere. So that's not going to do anything, essentially. It will just... Uh, It will, yeah, it will just uh, get rid of this, shift the, f the first moments, yeah? And this is the reason why then the, the, the first line is true. And then, so, let me write it down. Uh, blah, 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 so this is the trace of blah, blah, blah. And then there's dr dagger s. S J e to the minus psi J half X J squared plus P J squared and then S dagger D R and uh, okay so then I can bring this one that way and displace this commutator, which means I just end up with the vectors without the, without the, the, without the shift. And then I do the same with S. S dagger. But the beauty of this is that S, so that's why this formalism is so effective in this situation. Eh? I put the S there, I act, the, I act with the S on this one, but what will the S do? So something that I didn't write explicitly down before, but we established, is that this metaplectic correspondence means this thing, that S acting on all of this, and let me say that's an S dagger. I can decide any convention I want at this stage. It's going to be SR. Okay? Yeah? Someone must be kind of lost, because I explained this very badly on purpose. No, not on purpose. <laughs> yeah, see? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah. So, so is okay, so a S was a 2 m by 2 m matrix. So, so yeah, exactly. So this is, this is something that I said at the beginning and I kept it too implicit, I know. So basically, what we, sh what we show in this very part of the blackboard, unfortunately, like uh, in the previous lecture, was that when you evolve through a quadratic Hamiltonian, which is also gone, but <laughs> you will map, so the action of a quadratic Hamiltonian, uh, so essentially the, this action, there could be a minus plus, I always get this wrong, but never mind. Uh, yes, yeah, so this action, So that's an operator. This action, that is this operator, and by this action, I mean this action acting on each single canonical variable in the vector, yeah? As you, this could be U, the time evolution operator, is that, yeah? But I call it S, because it's a symplectic, incidentally. Acting on each single X and P, X and P, X and P in this, in this row will give me, uh, we saw that it will give us E omega H, forget me, let me, let me forget about the time, there's the time there, but I dispense with the time, I absorb it with in, in H, 
and times the original one, which I call SR, because that's symplectic. Why do I? Why do you yeah, because it's convenient. Because this, this S is the metaplectic representation in an infinite dimensional Hilbert space of this 2n times 2n transformation S. Through this mapping. Yeah? So. Let me, go, let, me, let, me, let me state this once more. So there's, there, are, there are this quadratic Hamiltonian. Oh, there's a half in my definition. I'm eh? really wrong. Quadratic Hamiltonians just defined this way, very kind of like uh, deceptively uh, harmless. And I call this S hat. Sorry? Yeah. Whereas this is without hat, yeah? No. No, they're not the same. So one is the metaplectic mapping through this procedure. Okay? This is a 2n by 2n matrix that says how the uh, canonical coordinates were shuffled by this operation. That's why these operations are linear, because they always end up being like a linear function of the others. You know, the new canonical uh, operators will be, a a will be a linear combinations of the original ones. Yeah? OK? So that's how that works. And that's why I'm writing these sort of things. But this is a really powerful statement. Yeah? So this is a vector of operator. I act with the same unitary on all the elements. And the effect of this action, which is the time evolution, is what, what happens in Heisenberg picture. The effect is that I combine them linearly through this other S, which is a 2n times 2n matrix, whereas this is an infinite dimensional operator given by that, which is very simple to write down in terms of X and P and exponentiation, uh, some exponentiation of X and P's. And see, the link is that this H, the H is the bridge. This H is the same as this H. Is it 2n times 2n symmetric matrix? Please, this is a time to ask questions. Yeah, 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 I could just put a T there and there. This will also change. No, okay, so, so there I'm just saying there is one that diagonalizes the H. This is instead a general statement that uh, through this, the same H, you can define an infinite dimensional operator that acts as a time evolution operator and a finite dimensional matrix that will also describe compactly this same time evolution. So these are, this is one statement. The other statement is that there's always an S that does that. Okay? Yeah? So, so this is powerful, and this is kind of something that generally is good to know, like if one is a physicist or like working in, in these areas. Uh, yeah? So, so now you see how powerful this is, because I can then... So this formalism is very, very effective because I can now, yes, through that, through this correspondence, what I'm going to do is, you see, the action of this on these operators, regardless of the fact that there's a commutator and all, is just going to be that, so, uh, let me write it down here. So S dagger. are, are uh, transposed S. He acts on everything. 
what's going to give you is SR. Well, you just have to think a little bit about this one, maybe. But. And then I can take it out. So without even getting my hands dirty with any of these S, I'll take it completely out of the equation out of everything actually here because these are just numbers not operators so the trace acts on the Hilbert space level so this is s times the trace of r rt and times you know the, the, the other but this operator is a very simple one it's Okay, so, so the action, D doesn't do anything on the second moment, it just, it just gets rid of this, obviously shifts, that's easy. S, will reshuffle them acting by congruence in the end. So here we are defining the second moments of the state, second order statistical moments. So the expectation values of XP plus PX, all second order combinations. And as in a Gaussian distribution, we expect it to describe the whole state. And they're also like immediately accessible. If you do uh, quadrature measurements, you can reconstruct these parameters. So hence the interest. So this thing there. So then I just need, we, we would just need to, um, to determine these quantities on this tensor product. It's very simple. I can do, we can do it uh, separately for each mode, because this is a local operator, like right, tensor product of local operators acting on each mode separately. And there's no combinations. And um, <laughs> and here, no, here I'm gonna just uh, give you the, the result because it will take, this is very tedious. I mean, and it's, it's also fairly straightforward. And, uh, Because what we're going to do is we're going to need to evaluate the expectation value of this and on. Uh, so we know how to diagonalize this in the Fock basis, each one of them. And then we will need to do the expectation values of things like 2xj squared, 2x, sorry, 2pj squared. And then um, xj pj plus pj xj. So one would need to go. I don't know. I don't think you want me to do this now. I mean, it's all in the notes, and it's just it takes a transformation to. You have to go to ladder operators, rewrite these things. What do you want? Do you want me to do this or? Shall I give you the, out, the, the, the result? And yeah. So the result is just, but well, you can follow it pretty easily. Uh, the result is just that this tensor product at the Hilbert space level would, tr would transform into a direct sum in phase space where Gaussian states are described. This is a general property which make the, this treatment very simple in a sense. Like um, expedient. So this is going to be S always acting on a direct sum of nu j, nu j for all j from 1 to n 
uh, as transposed, where nu j is 1 plus e to the minus psi j psi j. This is the psi j. And this you it comes from summing this geometric sum and, and their derivative is pretty simple. There's nothing mysterious there. So, we determined the, the covariance matrix, and this could also be not, well, but this is the covariance matrix of the most general Gaussian states, and uh, along with the first moments, which are completely separate, it describes, it also encodes all the degrees of freedom that we need to describe the state. Yeah? There's, in fact, this new j, they are the symplectic eigenvalues of the covariance matrix, and they are related to the symplectic eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian that define the states through this relationship. This was beta times them, but never mind. And likewise, uh, the other parameters are in S. Yeah? Well, not likewise, but the sides. And, uh, okay, so, so essentially we, we decompose the state, and one thing that we can do now is decide, okay, so one, one very interesting fact is that not all covariance matrices are, uh, um, physical covariance matrices, yeah? So as I mentioned, this is yet another way to describe Gaussian states, and it's a very efficient one, because these two parameters, the first moments and the second moments, they are directly accessible in the lab, yeah? So you can describe the state through this. And if you put them, if you, if you then go to the Wigner function representation, this, these parameters will be the... Um, actual covariance matrix and first moments of the distribution, or what you get as the Wigner distribution, okay? But, um, so now, something that I mentioned before when I referred to quantum key distribution is that, uh, there is, of course, an uncertainty principle. Now, one could express uncertainty principle maybe, maybe in a more sophisticated way as uh, entropic relations, because in the end they have to do with the entropies of, of, um, this, of some distributions, in a sense. But, um, but the standard, more traditional second moments approach which is the first layer of you know, uncertainty that you can ever define, is perfectly fine here. And uh, so, because everything is defined in terms of second moment, so uncertainty. And this will also be very useful later on to, to, to discuss the entanglement of these states. Uh, so, yes, let me define this. Tau is yet another matrix, and it's given by, so at this stage, the state could be Gaussian or not, okay? There's, there's no assumption of Gaussianity needed here. Okay? And uh, maybe with a two in front. The reason why I put a 2 is that this is equal to then So to make multimode statements, this formalism is definitely the most effective. Uh, okay, so, you know. The product, this product, even in the outer product sense, is given by the commutator 
So twice that is given by the commutator plus the anti-commutator of each element. But then, uh, of course, this is sigma. And this is plus i omega. Because this is just a constant number. And there's the trace of rho, right? Now, then consider consider uh, an operator which I'll call square root of two. I need yeah. Consider the operator O, which would be square root of two. Um, uh, Y, uh, sorry, Y dagger. Y is a vector with, uh, it's, a, it's a complex vector. And that's R. This is a, a scalar product, eh? So, and then, uh, what do I want to say? Ah, yeah. Okay, so the trace of rho or let's say O O dagger must be positive. Why? Rho is positive. O dagger is positive. Rho is positive. Yeah? But this is tau. This is the matrix tau. Well, this means, so, but this statement means that the matrix tau must be positive semi definite. Yeah? Uh, because this is true for all, for all vector y. Okay, and so we get the uncertainty principle. Uh, this, is, this is really very compact. <laughs> this is the uncertainty principle then. Ah, so let's see. Yeah, that's the most general second order expression. This is, this is due to, well, in various stages, but to Robertson and Schrodinger. So it's from the 30s, but um, in slightly different forms. Uh, and uh, let's see whether this is actually the uncertainty principle that we all know, right? So in a first, so single mode case, yeah, single mode case, what happens is uh, yeah, so the, the covariance matrix, let's, let alone, like, first moments are irrelevant, and we see why in a second. But um, the covariance matrix is given by, so there's the anti-commutator of x, x, which is uh, 2, And what's the anti x squared? So this is delta x squared. OK. And then there's 2 delta p squared. And then there's xp plus px. And uh, so if the state doesn't have XP correlations, which is something, an assumption which is often made, so say if this is zero, uh, sigma plus I omega is just this. Yeah? So now this is a two times two matrix. We have to check that it's strictly, well, that it is semi-definite, positive semi-definite. What do we check? Trace and determinant, eh? The trace is positive. 
nothing to say about that. So this is equivalent to determinant being positive, which is 4 delta x squared delta p squared uh, minus uh, 1 plus 1. Yeah, thank you. What am I doing? Yeah, I was seeing something was wrong, but I would have never found it. Uh, all right, so that's uh, your uncertainty principle. Yeah, delta x, delta p greater than h bar half. We have to put h bar back and, yeah. So, but this is the most general form on any number of degrees of freedom. Yeah, and we found it with one line, well, two, two lines. Um, cool. So we're going to need this big time. Ah, remember that this is, now we're going to fix this idea, and then we, we'll, we'll use it later on, because time-wise we're doing fairly well. Remember that we used the, um, What did we, uh, what did we say? Like, we used, yeah, we used the positivity of rho here. So this, this is a consequence of the canonical commutation relations and the positivity of rho. That's always the case for uh, uncertainty principles. Yeah? Now, uh, ah, yeah, there's that too, but... First, let me just say one, one, one more thing. So, now one final, or a few final comments on uh, how to manipulate Gaussian states. Something a bit more optical slash technological in some sense. So, so first off, there's the first moment. And it's not like the first moments can carry information. So for instance, teleportation with continuous variable was that first demonstrated with first moments. They are, they are relevant, and, have, and you can use them for, again, quantum key distribution, of course. So it's not like we don't care about them, but, but also first moments we, so first moments can adjust to the will with, with displacement operators. Okay, those D that we wrote before. But those Ds, let me remind you, they're like that. So they are generated by uh, Hamiltonians. This RT, don't be fooled, it's just nothing but a number. Omega is just a matrix that describes couplings, couplings but who cares? So they are generating by linear terms in X and P's. Okay, which means that we could rewrite them as a tensor product of local terms. Because, you know, exp um, operators pertaining to different uh, L2, like, uh, modes, they will commute. So I can just exponentiate in the, ten the exponentiate in the, the, the tensor products of exponent of, uh, yeah, exponentials would give me the exponential of the sum. So this could be Rj transposed omega 1 in the sense that this is omega for a single mode. And Rj. So they can be adjusted at with, first moments can be adjusted at will through local unitaries. So no, for instance, quantity that is, that, so, so no entanglement property can never be affected, depend on first moments, yeah? Because I can apply a local unitary and, and, and set them as I like. So, so they'd be a bit less interesting, and, and we're going to drop them for the rest of the lecture because I don't think they'd be re specifically relevant. 
So that's the that's the first thing. And how you do this? This is, this could be applying a classical current, or this is also the way you move you shift this this fields. If, for instance, if you have a system in a cavity, like a, a, a Fabry Perot or, or any any cavity, really any optical cavity, you you fit it with a laser to change the first moment. Yeah, it's it's a pump, and um, with a strong classical field, typically. So that's how you do it in practice. So so much for first moments now. Second order operations instead, the ones that apply this symplectic S that are behind these Hamiltonians, they're a bit richer and they will change, they will let you, for instance, they can create entanglement and squeezing as we are about to see. What are those? They are, um, They are, uh, yeah, let me start. I always start with something formal. So, singular value decomposition of a symplectic. It sounds like I'm about to say something awful, but trust me on this one. If you do a singular value decomposition, you're going to find this. And let's comment on this. Because there's all the building, block, the, the building blocks that are used in practice. So where R1, R2 belong to the intersection between O2N and the symplectic group. That is, they are both orthogonal and symplectic. So they preserve the trace, for instance, of sigma. So they don't change the, the free energy, the energy of the free Hamiltonian. They're called passive operations. And they're, in fact, realized on an optical table through essentially sequences of bin splitters and phase shifters. Phase shifters, they change, they're like, really like pieces of plastic that change the optical phase with respect to a fixed reference. Well, for ions, you just have to wait a little bit of time, and they will keep like rotating in this frame. And or um, or beam splitters that are just this semi-reflectant mirrors that will mix modes. And it's easy to get. There's a simple theorem that you can prove. It's the same theorem that you use to prove that you can do any unitary with two qubit gates and single qubit phases by using the very same theorem, because as it happens, I just mentioned this, not, not that they're that important, but, but it's important formally if you ever work in this field, uh, in this sub-area, let's say. So this, this subgroup, this is the, the, the maximum, maximal compact subgroup of the symplectic group. Uh, this subgroup is, um, isomorphic to UN, to, to, to the unitaries, as it happens. It's fairly easy to see and to prove. And uh, so, 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 so these operations can all be done with phase shifters, so which are simply this, cos phi, sine phi. So it's two-dimensional rotations for a single mode. And beam splitters. Beam splitters are slightly more sophisticated. They involve two modes. And in our notations, maybe they'll be relevant later, so I'll, uh, I'll mention them. In our notations, this is what they look like. Uh, yeah. Well, I could have found a better way, but never mind. I want to be very explicit. So that's a beam splitter. Basically, they rotate X's and P's in the same way for the two modes. And building this with this with all, on all modes and this within any pair of modes, you can build any of these R1, R2. And then we are left with Z. And Z is a squeezing operation. Z is.
So you can prove that the these are the singular value of a symplectic, and they come in pairs of inverses. And it is a squeezing operation in the sense that if you apply this z on a, a covariance matrix like this, which is balanced, you're gonna make you're gonna amplify this noise and suppress the other. Yeah, so that's what squeezing is. And by a squeeze state, we mean a state. Oh, by the way, the vacuum state in this formalism has covariance matrix sigma equal to the identity. And this is the only, well, this is a pure Gaussian state. Hmm? Gaussian state is pure if determinant of sigma is one, if and only if. Okay, so then uh, this, this is a squeezer that, and you can build up any symplectic that way, that's how you manipulate. And one thing which is also very interesting and very useful in practice is that uh, tensor products, as I already mentioned, at the Hilbert space level, they are always direct sums for Gaussian states. So if you want to take the partial trace, for instance, and you have a big sigma with billions of modes, you just have to take the submetrics pertaining to your mode or modes of interest. Yeah? You do a pinching. And so it means that sometimes you may want to prove, like, I don't know, say you want to prove what is the situation under this and that regime that, uh, not better specified, but that gives you the optimal cooling in optomechanics. Say you want to cool down the, the mechanical mode. Then if you are in, in a Gaussian regime, you can just look at the determinant of the mechanical mode and minimize it. This will give you the lower, now I didn't really go through this because it's, it's quite a lot too, but it's not, it's not that much after all. But the determinant for a single mode state, the determinant of the covariance matrix embodies, encodes all of the entropies. So if you want the, max, the optimal cooling, you want to minimize the determinant. And you can see, -ish. well, I don't know. It's not that simple, but now, but it's quite easy. Then we could have found the expressions for entropies based on these parameters that we have. Yeah, they all depend on the symplectic eigenvalues. Because we saw that this symplectic eigenvalue of the covariance matrix, in the end, they're also the ones that determine the spectrum of the states. Yeah, so. Okay, based on this introduction, maybe uh, later I can mention a couple of things more of, in order to, I want to rely this a little bit to the, the phase space picture of characteristic functions and Wigner functions that you're probably, or most of you will be very familiar with. But, and then I will go on and, and just want to give you an example of how to study entanglement in these systems. And then we'll see how much time we've got left towards the end. Thanks a lot for standing this.